Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's uh, great to be with you guys. Um, I uh, have had the privilege of teaching uh, around the world. I, I, I had no idea many years ago when I first uh, began ministry that the Lord was going to take uh, me into many countries around the world. Uh, today, I just well, just this last year, I was in 10 different countries teaching inductive Bible study. And I've already been this year into Guatemala, and uh, uh, I'll be heading to, uh, to um, where am I going next? I forgot where I'm going now. <laughs> um, uh, Brazil, I'm going to, uh, uh, in uh, about a week from now, I'll be heading to Brazil. So, But uh, anyway, uh, what happened a long time ago, I was a Calvary Chapel pastor. I had started Calvary Chapel of Banning. You all know where Banning is? See? All right. So you're all educated. You know, most countries I go to, I say, you all know where Calvary Chapel Banning is? And uh, most people in the U.S. don't know where Banning is, you know. But uh, <laughs> we uh, called it Calvary Chapel of the Pass uh, because everybody just passed on through, you know, <laughs> on their way to Palm Springs. And uh, so anyway, we, uh, we had a... Uh, a, a wonderful ministry there. The Lord blessed us and gave us a facility. And I was telling your pastor how, how we got our little church. And uh, and uh, today the church gr has grown so much that now they bought property in Beaumont. And uh, they have three morning services and the place is packed out uh, every Sunday. It's, uh, it's exciting to see what God's doing out that way. But anyway, uh, it's around 19... 85, the Lord called me to uh, leave my church and move to the Philippines because he began to show me a great need for training of pastors and leaders in how to study the word and then how to teach the word. And so in uh, 1985, we, my family took my three children and we moved to the Philippines and we began uh, a ministry of training and equipping pastors and leaders and little did I know, as I was there, I wrote this manual on how to study the word inductively. And little did I know the Lord was going to take that. And now it's all over the world, uh, including in China. Uh, of course, Russia, we've worked in for a long time. But, uh, you know, I, I've done seminars in China with the underground church there. I always felt like Agent 007 every time I went in there, you know, because I had to sneak around. They take me to the underground churches, and and uh, but uh, uh, it's just been exciting to see how God has taken this. And and today uh, the materials are being used in many countries around the world. But uh, it's just a very simple way of getting into the Word, and and so I, I'm just uh, so grateful that the Lord has given us this book that we can be students of the Word. And, and the, the course that he gave me, and again, it's, it's, it's just the work of the Holy Spirit because I'm not smart enough to put together a course to help people study. As I was uh, sharing this week at the conference, uh, uh, you know, I, I majored in college in uh, football. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, I went to college on a football scholarship, and I love playing football, and I love the game today, but... Uh, it, uh, uh, the Lord could take a guy that was not smart enough to get through school very well, uh, could take a football player and use him to t train people how to study the word. You, know, you realize God can do anything through anyone. And uh, so, but uh, this morning I wanted to talk to you about the power of prayer. And I, I know you're going into a week of prayer and and uh, I think often we, we don't realize just the incredible tool that God has given us and how powerful it really is. But uh, just to illustrate it uh, for you as we begin our text, I'm going to take you into the book of Acts, chapter 4. But uh, I, I wanted to tell you about uh, what happened to me many years ago in the Philippines. I was getting ready to go do a seminar and... I went to bed that night, had my bags packed, and I'm going to fly the next afternoon out to another island where I'm going to be conducting a seminar. They're expecting about 200 pastors there uh, for this conference. And so I went to bed, fell asleep, uh, and about two hours later, I woke up gasping for air. 
and I had never had any lung problems or issues with my with breathing, you know, or asthma or anything like that. But man, I could hardly breathe, and so I got up and I just started praying and praying, and it didn't get any better. And and so I woke up my wife and I said, "Honey, you got to pray. I don't know what's going on, but man, I just uh, I can hardly breathe." And, and and so my wife began to pray, and my wife's quite a prayer warrior, and she prayed and interceded for me, and finally it eased up a little bit, and I could uh, breathe a little bit better, and. So I, I uh, went back to sleep, but uh, I remember that morning getting up and I still didn't feel well and my chest hurt. And so, you know, I, I, I thought, you know, I better go see a doctor before I take off on this flight. So I got in to see a doctor right away and he ran a bunch of tests on me. I'll never forget, he, he um, came back to me and uh, he said, uh, Pastor Dan, I think you're having a heart attack. We gotta get you into the hospital right now. And when he said those words, heart attack, I heard this little voice that said, don't receive that. Now, I'm not an anti-doctor person. I appreciate them. Frequently, I have doctors traveling with me on my trips, and they do clinics and stuff. I really appreciate them. But something wasn't right with what he was saying, and I heard this little voice. Don't receive that. I said, doctor, I've got to go. I, I'm, I'm flying to a seminar this afternoon. I've got 200 pastors waiting for me. I've got to go do that seminar. He says, but you might die. And when he said those words again, that little boy said, don't receive that. So there was a lot of confusion going on in my mind. I said, doctor, I don't know what's going on, but I'm going home and I'll get back to you later. And I walked out of his office and man, he was not happy. <laughs> and my wife and I got down on our knees, began to pray and we're praying. And, and uh, uh, the, I just felt the Holy Spirit say, go do your seminar and I'll take care of you. So I did. I went and I tell you what, we had a, a terrific week as I worked with these pastors, it was just exciting, you know, and, and uh, uh, I didn't have any more trouble breathing, and I got back home, we were just rejoicing, I totally forgot about the whole incident until one month later, when I got a letter from a lady in my church that was a prayer warrior, and uh, uh, she said these words to me in this letter, she said, by the way, it took about a month to get a letter from the U.S. in those days, uh, long before the internet days and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> so <clears throat> I opened up this letter and I, I began to read and she said, Pastor, I just want to know if you're okay. She said, I was doing my laundry early one morning and all of a sudden I saw this vision of you and it was like somebody was taking your lungs and squeezing the air out of them and I knew you were in trouble. And she said, I just began to pray and intercede for you and I didn't have a piece about it. So I called the whole prayer chain and we were all praying for you. We just want to know, are you okay? And she gave me the day and the hour that she saw this vision, I believe from God. And it was the very hour, we were 16 hours ahead in the Philippines, that I'd woke up gasping for air. And you can't tell me that prayer is not a powerful tool. Amen. There are no limits. There's no boundaries to where your prayers can go. And I'm so thankful that, that we have that tool of prayer that God has given us. Well, you know, after I... After I uh, got that uh, letter, you know, and I began to think about that diagnosis, so I went back to see a heart specialist. And he ran all kinds of tests on me. And he came back and he says, uh, Pastor, your heart is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's strong. I began to think, what happened then? What was going on that day? And obviously it was spiritual warfare. The enemy was trying to stop me. The enemy is very powerful. And he can thwart us and, and give signs and symptoms and all kinds of things, you know, to fool us. And, 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 uh, and, and so the enemy was really trying to thwart me that day from going to do this seminar. But God intervened, praise God. And I'm so thankful for that, that tool of prayer. It's a powerful tool. And this morning I want you to look at a text with me in Acts chapter 4 that talks about prayer and the power of prayer. And uh, we're going to look at four things as we go through the text here. First, we're going to look at what the disciples did in their crisis time. Secondly, we're going to look at how they prayed in their crisis. Thirdly, we're going to look at their view of God. And I tell you what, this is so key, folks, because you understand your view of God is going to determine much of what happens with your prayers. Did you know that? Yep. Your view of God is going to determine much of what happens with your prayers. And then fourthly, we're going to see the results of this prayer, this power prayer that the disciples pray. 
So uh, uh, just a little bit of background. You know what's going on before because, again, context is so important when you study Scripture. And if you ever go through my course, you'll, you'll, you'll hear me talk a lot about context because that's what helps you to understand what the text says, what it's, what's, it's, it's talking about, so that you don't pull it out of its context. And uh, by the way, if you've never been through the inductive Bible study course, highly encourage you to go through it because it will give you a system of study and I guarantee it, it'll revolutionize the way you look at scripture. It's a powerful way to get into the word. Well, what has happened is Peter and John, if you remember the story, they were on their way to the temple shortly after Pentecost and there's a lame man at the gate, temple gate. Remember that story? And, uh, and uh, the Holy Spirit stopped Peter and John. It's the only reason they stopped. They gave focus to this man. This man's a beggar. And, uh, you know, one of the things I learned in the Philippines living there, a lot of beggars everywhere, you know. And when a guy's got his hand out, you know, if I look the guy in the eye, I'm hooked. <laughs> and so I typically would look away, you know. I had this one guy in the Philippines that used to, he, he, he would follow me around and I'd be walking down the street and he'd tap me on the back. I'd turn around looking, big smile on his face, got a hand out like this, you know. And I'm hooked, you know. This guy had me pegged every time I'd give him a few pesos, you know. But uh, uh, anyway, Peter and John gave focus to this man and said, look at us. And then Peter said those infamous words, silver and gold have I none, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. And then Peter did this amazing bold step. He just reached down and pulled up this man that had never walked before. And the text says instantly, he was walking and he entered into the temple. First time he'd ever been into the temple. And he says he was walking and leaping and praising God. Amen. If you ever go back and read Isaiah chapter 35 around verse 6, it talks about that very thing Isaiah prophesied, how the lame will leap and jump for joy. And so uh, this guy, it was an amazing miracle and everybody was given attention and Peter preached this amazing message and, and, and we know that 5,000 men responded to the gospel that day. Oh, amazing. You talk about amazing results. And, and, and you would think the religious leaders would have been thrilled that all these people had turned their hearts to God and this man was healed, but they were anything but thrilled. And they had Peter and John arrested and thrown in prison. And then they interrogated him. And the, uh, the, the, uh, this, this group of men uh, that are so powerful, you know, they, 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 they interrogated them. And, and, and Peter was so bold as he faced this Sanhedrin, kind of like our Supreme Court. You know, they're a very powerful group of men. And, and, uh, you know, our Supreme Court today, I believe, is just as confused as these men were in that day. <laughs> and, 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 and so uh, they, 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 they wanted to, you know, they wanted to put Jesus to death, but they couldn't do it. They had to put, have Rome do it, you know. And so these guys were powerful. They got a lot of power. They threatened, we're told, Peter and John severely and said, don't you preach in the name of Jesus anymore. And then they, because of the miracle, and they couldn't deny it, the, you know, the fact that this, everybody knew this guy. He was a temple fixture. He was more than 40 years old, the text tells us. And he'd been placed there at the temple gates every day. Everybody saw him. You realize that Jesus himself would have walked right by this man as he entered into the temple. And, and so nobody could deny the miracle. And then the result was, uh, after this interrogation, you know, what did the disciples do after they were severely threatened, these two, uh, Peter and John? And we pick up there in our text in, in verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that's in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people's plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, 
whom you annoy are both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant that your service that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Would you just join me in a word of prayer? Father, as we divide this, this beautiful text on prayer, we invite your Holy Spirit now to come and to be our teacher. Open our minds and our hearts. Lord, I pray that not one person sitting here this morning would not be moved by your Holy Spirit through your power of your word. And so, Lord, thank you for this time. And we ask uh, your blessing now in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, what did the disciples do after they were severely threatened? By the way, go back in verse 13. I, I love this. Uh, uh, it says uh, of chapter four there, verse 13, it says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized they had been with Jesus. And folks, do you realize you don't have to go to seminary to be used by Jesus? You don't have to go to Bible school. You see, he can use anybody. You just got to spend time with Jesus. And you be in his presence and, and get into his word, folks. And, and what you're going to find is he's going to use you powerfully. But this book is so important. Now, as I go through our text, as I go through the verses, I want you to notice I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an inductive Bible study here. And I'm going to do three things. Okay, first, you're gonna, I'm going to make observations of what we just looked at here as we're working through the verses. Secondly, I'll draw interpretations. And then thirdly, I'll make some applications as we go. And that's this inductive study. It's very simple. It's not complex. And anybody can do this. All right, so notice what they did. They, it says that they went to their own companions. Uh, and they told them everything that they had done and taught. So... Uh, they didn't go and hide somewhere. You know, that's what the enemy loves to happen to you. When you are in a crisis situation, and we all go through them. We all have these hard times that we struggle with. You see, where do you go? Well, God's given us the body of Christ. He's given us one another. And when we go through crisis times, we need to pray for one another. We need the support of the body. But so often the enemy, you know, because it's a little embarrassing, maybe what we went through and we really don't want anybody to know. And so we keep it all to ourselves. And boy, I tell you, the enemy's got you right where he wants you. We need the body of Christ. And notice they didn't hide anything. You know, it's a little embarrassing. They got arrested. They got thrown into prison. Uh, and yet they shared with the body exactly what happened. And so then notice in verse 24, it says, when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord. Okay, what does that mean? One accord. Well, it's the idea that they prayed together, that they were really focused on that. Now, when you get together, especially in small groups to pray, and, you know, you're opening it up for everybody to pray in your small little group, you know. I have found that we often don't pray very well together in the small groups. You know, I, I remember as a boy growing up, and uh, uh, we, we had prayer meetings on Wednesday night. I had very godly parents, and I went to church every Sunday, twice on Sunday in the midweek, and I, whether I wanted to go or not, and... <laughs> And prayer meeting was Wednesday night. Not very many people came, you know, but in that prayer meeting, we'd get the request. And so now we're going to pray as a small group together, you know, and, and there's this guy that sat in the front row and this guy could pray like nobody's business. Man, he was eloquent and he would just flow. And he prayed about all the subjects that were on our list, you know, and so you're going, you know, the, uh, there's really nothing I can pray about. This guy just prayed it all. And he did it so much better than I could do it. You know, I'm not going to open my mouth. I don't dare open my mouth. And so actually what that man was doing is he was discouraging the rest of us from praying. Isn't that interesting? 
And I have found there's a very effective way to pray in a group. Now, individually, when you're praying, man, you can pray eloquently as you want by yourself. You know, but when you get in a small group with other people, you want to encourage people to learn to pray in one accord. And you know how you do that? You pray topically. In other words, you just bring up one thing at a time. You don't pray about 10 things. You bring about one thing at a time. You, and you give room for the group now to focus on that one need. And there's going to be several in that group are going to have, you know, the, the Holy Spirit. I, I love what Jude says. He says, pray in the Holy Spirit. You know what that means? You give room for the Holy Spirit to move in your hearts and he's going to give you words of knowledge. He's going to give you insights that you would have never got before, but it's because of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He moves in those times and you can begin to pray. And there's times in these little prayer groups you know, as we're praying, the Holy Spirit will give me a, a, a thought about this need in this situation, and I'll just start praying. And I had no clue what it was in that person after I prayed, uh, uh, prayed for them. They, they said, how did you know that? I, I didn't. It was just the Holy Spirit, see? And, and so you pray about one thing at a time. You know, somebody says, uh, Lord, I, uh, I, you know, uh, my brother John is just really struggling right now in his walk with you. Lord, we just want to lift him up. And I just ask that you just help him and, and encourage his heart. And, and, and I stop. It's a short prayer. I don't go on and on and on. And then I give room for somebody else. Say, and, and Lord, we just pray for John right now that your Holy Spirit would just move in his heart and his life. And would you just encourage him now and just touch his heart? And he stops. And somebody else adds to that prayer. Do you see what I'm talking about? It's the way we talk together. We talk topically. You know, the weather, man, it's beautiful out today. Boy, uh, uh, the day before, it was raining when I woke up, you know. And, and you talk about the weather and you go back and forth. And, and, and that's the way we talk, topically. But for some reason, when it comes to prayer, we don't do that anymore. And, and the tendency is to pray for about four, five, six different things at once. And then the next person will pray. And nothing ever really gets focused on. Do you hear what I'm talking about? And it's so important to focus and pray in one accord. Everybody praying together for that specific need, focusing on it. Now, there's other ways you can pray in one accord. You know, uh, I'll never forget when I was in India on a, doing a seminar that uh, uh, I had just got word from home. My daughter, my second daughter, I have four kids, and, and uh, my second daughter uh, was pregnant, and she lost her baby at six months. And I was away. My heart was broken. I wanted so much to be there, but I couldn't, you know. And so I was just, I was just, uh, I, I just, I said to my host, I said, you know, I'm really upset just before the seminar started. And I said, uh, would you just pray for me? You know, uh, and I told him the situation. And he says, okay. And he got up and walked away. <laughs> you know, I'm going, you know. But he walked right up on the stage and there's about 400 pastors out there in the congregation. And he said, you know, before we start, we're going to pray for Pastor Dan because he just got word about his daughter and so forth. And uh, so I thought he was just going to lead out in prayer. But instead of him leading out, I heard 400 voices all at once praying for me. And it was powerful. It's like that roof was just, you know, blown off with those prayers. And there's lots of different ways you can pray together in one accord. But, but that's so important to learn to pray together and, and allow the Holy Spirit to move as you pray. And I, I tell you, uh, I have a, our little church that uh, I've been a part of up in Colton. Uh, my son-in-law started it about five years ago. It's a tiny little church. There's not as many people as you guys. And, uh, uh, you know, we've just, uh, we've just every, every Sunday night we get together, there's about four of us. And when I'm there anyway, I'm not there a, a lot, but, but uh, uh, we pray. And that's the way we pray every Sunday night. And the Holy Spirit moves. And man, I tell you, all kinds of things come out. It's really exciting when you go through that kind of a prayer. Well, uh, I want you to notice next in our text, uh, it says, they raised their voice to God in one accord and they said, Lord, you are God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them. And so now I want you to look as they begin to pray. I want you to see their view of God here. And again, it's so important, your view of God. 
But you see, how did they view God there? As they've opened the uh, opened up their the the text, and they said uh, they said, "You've made the heavens and the earth and the sea, and all that's in them." Well, obviously, they view God as the Creator. And is the Creator a big God? He can do anything, can't he? You see, they've got a big view of God. And as they pray, they know they're talking to the guy that made everything. He's made you and I. It's just incredible the, the fact that we can talk to the creator of the universe. I, I, I talked to him this morning. How about you? And, and uh, I just, I love that thought that I can talk to the creator. And at any time, any moment. And so they viewed him, first of all, as the creator. Secondly, I want you to notice, as they continued their prayer, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? And the kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. What's their view of God there? Well, do you, do you see what they're doing they're, they're, they're praying right from Scripture. They're, they're, they're actually, it, it, it comes in the Psalms, Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. They just quoted the Psalms in their prayer. Why did they do that? Well, because they understand that God speaks through His Word. Do you understand that? And in crisis times, we need to turn to the word. And I can't tell you how many times over the years, as I've gone through crises, uh, in my prayer, I'm praying, and the Holy Spirit directs me to prayers to pray right out of the scripture. There's over 300 prayers in our Bible, right out of scripture. Powerful prayers. I love Paul's prayer where he he prays in, in Ephesians, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. Wow that you'd know the hope of his calling and the riches of his glory of his inheritance in the saints. And on and on and on he prays. Powerful prayers. Well, you can pray for that for me anytime, you know. But, but prayer is a powerful tool and you can pray right from Scripture as you pray. I'll never forget, I was, uh, I was actually headed to Russia and I was flying on an airplane. And what had happened is I had, I had uh, uh, just met with uh, Pastor Chuck uh, at Costa Mesa along with several other Calvary Chapel pastors and uh, Dr. Bill Bright of Campus Crusade for Christ and some of his top guys. We had a meeting together. And this was in 1991. Now, we had just moved back from the Philippines. The work was going great there. I turned it over to some of my staff, and I knew the Lord was going to expand our work. And so I've been, we were waiting on the Lord about six months, and nothing was happening. And all of a sudden, I got a call from Pastor Chuck and asked me to go to this meeting. And so now I'm in this meeting, and uh, I have known Dr. Bright. Uh, and I knew uh, of him, you know, and his great work with Campus Crusade for Christ. Well, they had been doing, uh, showing the Jesus film in Russia. And they'd been showing it on television and top, some of the top officials in the land even were giving their hearts to Christ. They estimated um, more than a couple million Russians prayed the prayer after watching the Jesus film. And there were so many new converts. And and Dr. Bright said, "Uh, Pastor Chuck, we need churches to go in there and minister to these new converts. He says, the churches in Russia are so difficult to work with. And, and, and part of the problem was that they, these guys, the churches were so afraid of being infiltrated that any time a new person came into the church, they were interrogated. And, and you didn't, it wasn't a most welcome place to try to go into. And he says, we, we need somebody that doesn't have a lot of red tape and, and they can just send missionaries in and just begin training and equipping and so forth. And anyway, he said, Pastor Chuck, can Calvary Chapel help us? Well, Pastor Chuck just sat there. He didn't respond right away. And then he began to stare right at me. 
And uh, boy, I got uncomfortable with that stare. And then he goes, you know, Dan, I, I want you to share with Dr. Bright what you've been doing in the Philippines. And so, uh, man, I, I was shocked. And I was uh, suddenly in the spotlight, you know, because all these guys that were there, I kind of admired, lifted them up. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, I'm, I'm talking and I shared with them how, how we had been training pastors and leaders and how to get into the Word through the inductive Bible study system and how God was just blessing and moving in a powerful way. And, and when I got done, uh, uh, Dr. Bright said, that's exactly what we need to have happen in Russia. And Pastor Chuck looked at me and he says, well, Dan, when can you go? <laughs> and so I prayed about it. And before I left, Dr. Bright gave me his personal uh, phone number. He says, listen, if you need anything, we got lots of contacts in Russia, call me and I can help you. And uh, so uh, I prayed and it was December. The Lord just put on my mind, go in December. And so uh, I called Dr. Bright up at Campus Crusade because I lived over in Redlands area, you know, and, and they're just up in San Bernardino Hills there at Arrowhead Springs. And and so uh, I called him and he said, yeah, come on over. I want to talk to you. And, and so I went over and we spent about three hours together. And I said, Dr. Bright, God's saying that I, I really feel like I'm supposed to go in December. And he goes, Dan, that's a terrible time for you to go. All of our staff will be gone. So we, we can't help you if you go in December, you know. And, and uh, so uh, uh, he said, why don't you pray about another time? So I did. And uh, boy, it just kept, kept, kept coming back, go in December. And so... Uh, I called Dr. Bright back up again. I said, he, Lord keeps saying December. And Dr. Bright said, okay, well, I'll be praying for you. <laughs> and so now I'm on the airplane. I'm flying to Russia, right? And I have no contacts. I have no idea where I'm going, except there's a guy picking me up at the airport and taking me to this hotel. And so I'm flying on the airplane. I'm a little bit nervous because I don't know. I've never been to Russia. In fact, I... I, that would be the last place in the world I would have ever wanted to go. As a kid growing up, Russia was my enemy. And I remember when they built bunkers thinking Russia might bomb us, you know. And so, you know, here I am going to this foreign country, and I'll never forget, I, I'm just kind of reading in Isaiah, the 42nd chapter, and on the 16th verse, it just jumped out at me. And it says, I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. I will lead them in paths they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and not forsake them. And I understood the context. You know, Isaiah is talking to the children of Israel who have rebelled against God. But he's giving them hope. And I want to tell you, this message gave me hope. I felt God was speaking directly to me because I was the blind guy. I had no clue where I was going. And uh, uh, I, was, I got to Russia, and this guy took me to this hotel. It was called the Ismailov Hotels, and they were built for the Olympics. There was, there was uh, uh, about 400 rooms in three different towers, huge hotel. And uh, actually, there's more than that. But uh, they took me up to the, about the 34th or 40th floor, somewhere there. And uh, I'm walking down this, this hallway to my room. And two doors before my room, there's a door that's open. And as I'm walking close, I can hear these guys talking out loud. And they're talking in English. And so I stopped. And I just listened to their conversation. And I could tell from their conversation, they were believers. And so I stuck my head in the door and I introduced myself, said, hello. And, and, uh, and uh, they started talking to me and said, oh yeah, we're from Campus Crusade for Christ. And we weren't supposed to be here, but we had a problem. So we had to meet and work through these issues. And, and so I told them how I just met with Dr. Bright and how he'd told me what, you know, what we had met with, together with Pastor Chuck and so forth. And, and they said, oh, we can help you. We've got all kinds of contacts. And, and, and so they gave me the contacts and that was the beginning of God opening incredible doors. I began going in and doing seminars in Russia. And uh, I still have staff in Russia to, to this very day, still teaching inductive Bible studies to churches all over Russia. Wow. But many Calvary chapels came in after that trip to Russia and where the Lord began to move and, and went up to Twin Peaks and, 
And that's where Pastor Ruben, you were at that conference. We had over 200 guys, took them through inductive Bible study. I said, guys, we've got to take this to Russia. And uh, I tell you what, guys started going out. And uh, it's an amazing story how God began to spark. That was really the spark in missions in Calvary Chapel. And God just took these guys. I went up to Seattle and trained more guys. I went to Indianapolis and trained some more. And one of the guys that I trained was George Markey, who had nine children. And he felt the call of God to take his family to Ukraine. And everybody told him he was absolutely crazy. And uh, he called me and says, everybody's saying this. And I said, George, you've got to do what God's calling you to do. And George went, and God used that man in an incredible way. And you know, all of his kids today are missionaries all over in different parts of the world today. Amazing how God used that in so many people's lives. Well, uh, God speaks through his word. I could go on on more stories. Sorry about that. But, but you, you see the power of God's word? He speaks through his word. And, and so in crisis times, you know, turn to the word of God and pray right from the word. It's a, it's a wonderful way to pray. We were just at a prayer meeting. Uh, we were having prayer down there at the conference this week. And as we were praying, people were just constantly praying from the scriptures. It's so, so exciting. Well, um, the next thing I want you to notice, uh, it says in verse 27, for truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Do you see their view of God there? They view that God's in absolute control. They recognize their very circumstances that they were in were right there in the scripture and that God was in control. He's going to do what he's intended to do. Do you know that God's in control today? He sits on the throne. And, you know, sometimes it looks like everything's in chaos. Everything's a mess. But I tell you what, God is using the events of the world today to bring men to Jesus Christ. And I love, uh, you know, in the book of uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel, uh, I believe it's uh, chapter 2, verse 21, he says, uh, he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and he raises up kings. What did we just see happen a few weeks ago in our elections? See, God appoints whomever he desires. He uses men, some wicked and some, some honorable, God-loving, you know. He uses all kinds of people for his purposes, but he's in absolute control. And I'm so glad he sits on the throne today. He's in control. Because we go through all kinds of things, folks. We go through all kinds of struggles, and, and, and we have to understand no matter what we go through, God is in control. He's using things in our lives for his honor and his glory. I, uh, uh, Ten years ago, uh, we had adopted a little Filipino baby in the Philippines. Amazing story. I, I don't have time to go into it. It's, it's a great story, but uh, it's a long story. But we had ended up adopting this little guy. And he became such an incredible picture because he had no hope and no future. He was abandoned. I had literally picked him up off the road, left for dead. And uh, we got him into the hospital and, and he didn't die. As the doctor said, he's not going to make it. He's so far gone. But the end result was he, he lived. And, and so we, re- we adopted him. He became our fourth child. And he became an incredible picture of God's grace where there was no hope and no future. And what Christ did, he came into our lives. And you and I, he paid the price for us. And we were adopted in the family of God. And we're children of of the king. You know, we're a part of God's family. We're so privileged. And God's done so much for us. And he became such a beautiful picture. Aaron would travel with me. He traveled literally all over the world, countries. And at the end of my seminar... I'd ask Aaron to come up and he'd stand right next to me. I'd put my arm around him and I'd tell the story of how I found him and how God had spoken to me that, that um, we were to not only to keep Aaron, but Aaron would become a sign to us of what God had called us to do because 
uh, God said, he's weak and he's frail. And the Lord said, that's the picture of my church in the Philippines. It's weak and frail. But the, as you, as you uh, take him into your home and feed him and nourish him, he's going to grow and become strong. And, and, and that's the picture of what my word will do for my church. It's going to make the church strong. And that's why I brought you to the Philippines to train my people how to get into my word and make and grow and become strong as a church. And, and, and so, you know, he, I would tell that story and pastors frequently, you could just see tears coming down their face, you know, and it's just a great story. And then, then uh, 10 years ago, the day before his 21st birthday, Aaron was killed in a motorcycle accident. And I talk about being devastated. It was so painful. But we knew that we had a choice in the midst of that crisis. We, we could have gotten bitter towards God. And I understand totally why parents get embittered towards God when they lose a child. It's, it's a terrible, terrible thing to go through. And yet we knew that God was in control of our son's life. At his funeral, more than 400 people. There was a couple thousand people who came to his funeral. He's so well known. He became a phenomenal athlete. He was a football player, was all everything, you know. And God just used his life. But in his death, 400 people came to Christ. And I, I don't understand why God did that. You know, it was painful. But God has his purposes. He's in absolute control. And I'm so thankful that he sits on the throne. And so we see that the disciples' view of God, first of all, they saw him as the creator. Secondly, they saw him as a God who speaks through his word. And thirdly, they, they acknowledged that God, they recognized that God was in control of everything. Do you understand that God's in control today? Yes. And then I want you to notice in verse uh, uh, verse uh, 29. Look how they're praying here. Now, Lord, look at their threats and grant that your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. Do you see what they're doing here? They're not going, Lord, man, we are in a really bad situation. We need to get out of this. They're not praying to escape. Do you see what they're doing? They're praying, Lord, give us boldness to go through this. And folks, I want to tell you, that's the right way to pray when you're going through a crisis time. Don't pray to get out of it. Pray, Lord, give me boldness to go through it. I want to learn what you want to teach me through this circumstance, through this situation. I don't want to escape it. I want to learn from this time. Even when we do stupid things and we suffer the consequences, you know, we want to say, Lord, okay, I realize I just blew it, but I know that you can work good out of evil and you're going to work something good out of this circumstance because you're in control and so they're praying through their circumstances they're not praying to get out of them the very thing that they had been threatened don't you preach in the name of Jesus anymore and they're saying Lord give us boldness that, they, that we may speak your words and then notice in verse 30, by stretching out your hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. What's their view of God there? Well, they view God as a God of action. They believe that God is a God that will work as they pray. Do you, do you believe that God's going to work as you pray? See, is your view that, that, that he's a God of action or... Is your view, I just really don't know if you really want to do anything, Lord. I, I'm just not sure you can handle this circumstance I'm in. You know, we feel that way sometimes. It's such a big thing to us. But again, see, how big is your God? And, and, and they, they, they want God to move. They want him to act. And folks, when you want God to move, and you ask him to move, he will move. And he will work according to his purpose and his plan. But he longs for his people to cry out to him, say, Lord, I need you to move here. I want you to do this. Yeah. Sometimes he will say, absolutely, he'll move right away. Other times he'll say, no, I don't want to do this this way. I'm going to do it a different way. And then other times he'll say, I want you to wait. Now, I hate that. I don't like the waiting part. 
I like to hear the yes, you know, see. <laughs> but God is always going to answer your prayers. Do you understand that? He's the powerful God who loves to move as people pray. And then notice, lastly, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. It's like God just took a hold of that building and shook it and said, yes, right on. That's the way to pray. That's praying with power. You see, they had the right view of God. And when you pray, and, and you have the right view of God, you're praying with power. And I wonder this morning, how big is your God? Do you really believe God can answer your prayers? Yes. Do you believe that God can do miracles and signs and wonders? I was in India doing a seminar and I was having lunch one day between sessions and they brought in a man who was a pastor and he was, he was ministering in the country of Bhutan, which is just above India there, a tiny little country. It's a Buddhist uh, run country by a king and, uh, and the king has declared no other religion but Buddhism. And if you are caught in Christian activity, He'll put you to death. So it was not an, uh, a very safe play to serve Jesus, place to serve Jesus. And this, this pastor had been doing radio broadcasts, and that's why he was down where I was at, and uh, he was at my conference. But he, uh, he, he was uh, telling me how God was just moving in a powerful way, and he'd started lots of underground churches, and he was broadcasting into the country. And so I said to him, I said, well, well how did you become a Christian then? And he said, well, it's a long story. And he was very hesitant to share the story with me. And finally, I kind of pushed him. And so he, he began to share how he said that uh, he was uh, living with his parents. He, uh, he was married, had two small children, very common over there, families all living together. And he said that uh, he had a very successful job and was doing great. And um, he said his parents had been listening to Christian radio broadcasts and gotten saved. And so they started witnessing to him and they're saying, son, you need Jesus. And, and he goes, I don't need Jesus. I've got a great job. I'm making good money. I, I've got a car. You know, I've got everything I need. I don't need Jesus. And he said one day when he was long, a uh, long ways away from home, he got a call from his mom. And uh, she said, hon, you got to get home as soon as possible because your little baby has gotten really sick and we think he might die. And so he said, I got home as fast as I could, but it took me hours to get home. And by the time I got home, he said, my, my baby son was dead. And the doctor had already been there. And, and, uh, and so uh, he said, I, I walked over and looked at the lifeless body of my son laying there on the bed. And he said, I just lost it. And he said, I was just weeping. And he said, about that time, my mom came over. And she said, son, we've been reading in the Bible that Jesus can resurrect the dead. And we'd just like to ask him to do that for your son. And, and he said, I looked at my mom and dad. And he goes, mom, dad, if this Jesus would resurrect my son from the dead, I'd give my life to serve this Jesus. <laughs> He said, my parents had this childlike faith. He said, they just laid hands on the baby. They began to pray for the baby and they prayed and they prayed. And he said, all of a sudden we realized as they were praying, the baby was starting to breathe again. And then the baby began to stir and then the baby began to cry. And he said, God resurrected my baby son right in front of my eyes. He said, I got down on my knees right there and I gave my life to Jesus and I've been serving him ever since. Amen. He said, the king, he, he, he knows what I'm doing and he's trying to catch me and he's, trying to, he's probably going to kill me. But he says, I don't care because Jesus has given me new life and he gave my son new life.
And as I was talking to him more, I found out why he was so hesitant to share this story with me. You know why? Because he'd shared the same story with another American missionary that had come through. And that guy didn't believe him. Didn't believe him. And I go, why not? Is he a big God or is he a big God? Can he still resurrect the dead? I've never seen it. But I've heard a lot of stories, and I'm sure you have too, that God is still doing that today. And you see, so many of us, sometimes we hear stories, we go, yeah, nice missionary story. But come on, does God really do that? Why not? You see, we have a big, big God. And we so often are like the children of Israel where we limit the Holy One of God. And I believe that God wants to do great and mighty things. Folks, you guys are in the beginning of a a prayer season right now. And I tell you what, God can use your prayers to shake this valley right here. You realize that? He can use you to touch the lives of so many people. Look what 12 disciples did. They changed the world because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They believed that God was a God who's in absolute control, can do whatever he desires to do. And they were praying that way. And I want to encourage you this week as you pray and fast. And that's such a such an important thing to do, you know, for all of us is, is just taking that time. You know, it's something that my wife and I have done for years is on a weekly basis, we pray and we fast. You know, one day out of the week. And uh, it it started, first of all, with us praying over our children. Because we knew our kids were, you know, our kids grew up in the mission field. And we came back to the States, you know, they were in high school and college. And, and, you know, it's a difficult time, you know. And and, and we prayed and fasted for our kids. And Every one of our children are in the ministry serving Jesus today. And, and I realize, you know, you, you, those children make that choice. But we have to pray and intercede for our kids because the enemy wants to come right into our homes. And boy, it's so easy today for him to come right in through the internet, you know, through TV, through the radio. There's so many ways the enemy comes right into our home. And I can't tell you how many times with my youngest son, Aaron, he he was our most difficult child. And there was times where we knew he came home with bringing home a spirit from the world. And when he would go to bed, my wife and I would slip into his bedroom and lay hands on him and just rebuke that spirit that that he had brought home that day because it wanted to devour our home. And God wants us to be men and women who believe in prayer and he wants to break us to break the strongholds of the enemy. They're so powerful. And we can do that as we pray. I, I love what uh, Paul says in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. He says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. We have a great God. He loves you. He cares for you. He's bought you with a price. Therefore, glorify your body. Glorify God in your body. Let him use you for his purposes and his plan. Every single one of you here He's got a purpose for. There's not one of you sitting here this morning that God went, oh man, I blew it with that guy. (laughs) But he's got a purpose for every single one of you. He he wants to work through your life. Let's believe him for big things. Amen? Amen. Now, we can take anything to God in prayer. Doesn't matter how big or how small. Even asking for a parking place. But let's believe God for great things. Oh, we ask him for a lot of little things. Sometimes, but are you asking for the bigger things too? So I want to just encourage you guys. I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing this week. 
and I hope you'll take it to heart, be men and women that are warriors through prayer. Uh, I, uh, as I travel around the world, every time I go on a trip, I have a group of people. I've made many friends in many lands. I've taught inductive Bible study in more than 51 countries around the world. Churches, uh, and I have so many churches today. When I go out, I send a prayer request, they pray, and I know that God works miraculously because they're praying, interceding. Because the enemy hates what I do. And he wants to come against me. But God's people pray. And God answers prayer. Amen.